Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, so I figured people would be sick of Windows internals talks all the time, so instead I decided to do my usual once every two years hardware talk. Um, so this one's called Fun with Sam. Um, Sam's over there if you want to have fun with him. Um, but this is the Sam aggregator, uh, Surface Aggregator module that we'll be talking about. And if you attended my No Such Con talk from two years ago, or three years ago now, um, and then about the Apple SMC, uh, and then I gave another talk about the Apple SMC at Recon uh, as well a few years ago. This is going to be kind of similar, um, same type of hardware chip, but this one's found in, um, in Surface Books, Surface Pros, etc. So I'll mention what the SAM is, but um, if you came here for Windows, sorry, but there will be a little bit of Windows. So uh, by myself first, so currently Vice President of CrowdStrike um, of EDR Strategy, but most of what I do is reverse engineering Windows, um, doing courses, trainings, um, and conference speaking, usually about Windows security issues. Um, but when there's interesting hardware security issues, I'll um, often talk about those as well. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, at ANSCO, I'll probably publish the slides there um, in a few weeks or months or years. Um, and my blog there if you want some, some more information about that. Also, the latest Windows Internal 7 book just came out, in case you didn't know. Um, finally got a chance to work on that with Pavel, so really, really happy to finally have a Win 10 book um, out there. Anyway, so I'll be talking about um, kind of embedded controllers in SAM. Uh, specifically, we'll be talking about SAM, but I'll kind of mention the type of device that a SAM is, that the SAM is, and kind of what embedded controllers are. Talk about the capabilities and communication mechanisms you have with SAM. Um, and then I'll talk about HID over I2C. Um, we'll talk about what HID is, uh, what HID over I2C is, and how we can use HID over I2C to actually talk to SAM um, you know, for the demo, if it hopefully works, um, to talk to this chip. And then I'll talk about firmware updates. Because as soon as you have a processor, um, a coprocessor, or an embedded controller, or a microprocessor in your computer, um, my interest is always, well, okay, sure, how can I talk to it, but also how can I flash it? How can I put my own code on it? And what, what is that going to look like? And then I'll give it a little conclusion um, with some, some parting thoughts about this research. So let's talk about embedded controllers and about SAM for a moment. So as soon as you have a system with a battery, a charging circuit, um, you're going to need to manage the battery life, manage the battery power, uh, control the charging, you know, prevent um, spontaneous exothermic rundown reactions, aka explosions. Um, and you're also going to have to manage uh, things like perhaps the brightness of a screen. Um, these types of devices that have batteries usually have accelerometers, gyroscope, magnetometers, because they're usually small devices or laptop-like devices. Um, and typically you can have an on-off button or a volume button as well. Right? So this looks very similar to a laptop or a tablet or a phone. All these types of devices that have such things like batteries and sensors and buttons usually have something called an embedded controller which manages all of these things. So all your laptops have an embedded controller um, and there's an ACPI standard around that. Now these embedded controllers are usually um, MCUs, so they're usually very uh, simple microcontrollers. For example, the one in the Surface is an 8051. So really, really simple, dumb 8-bit microcontroller. Doesn't need a lot of logic. And then there's interfaces through a CPI to talk to it, to detect it, to get events from it, so that, for example, if I shake the, the surface really, really badly, um, you know, it can send an event to the OS to, I don't know, turn off the hard drive, for example, or, or something like that if it was a rotational hard drive. Um, some desktops can also have embedded controllers. That's a little bit more rare, though, because your desktop typically just has a power button on the power supply, and that's like a connection between those two. Um, there's usually no battery in your desktop. So desktops could have embedded controllers, but you typically find them in laptops, tablets, and, and those types of devices. Now, what's interesting about them is they're directly connected to the battery. So they kind of have their own power source. Um, and even if your battery is almost completely uh, run out, 0%, the embedded controller is usually still going to be active. I mean, you really have to drain that battery to zero, 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 zero for the embedded controller itself to turn off. Um, and sometimes they even have their own batteries that are external batteries um, separate from the main laptop battery. So uh, what's nice about embedded controllers is they have a very long lifetime. They don't consume a lot of power. So it, it's a nice place to, to play around in. Um, now, the thing is, if your laptop's more advanced and has lots and lots of sensors, 
Um, if it has custom external ports, um, you're probably going to need something a little bit more advanced than an embedded controller. For example, on Apple systems, we have the SMC that I've talked about a few times, which is an ARM processor. Um, on the surface, you have also an ARM uh, system on chip, and that's what the SAM is. The SAM is the sensor aggregator module, which then later became the system aggregator module, and now they sometimes call it a surface aggregator module. And it's an ARM processor on the Surface devices, Surface Book, Surface Laptop, Surface Pro, um, which talks to the embedded controller. So it's not the embedded controller. It's an additional chip on top of the embedded controller and has uh, a bunch of complex capabilities, mostly around um, sensor aggregation, but also around the fact that the Surface has a port on the side, which uh, can be used for charging, but also potentially other things. And of course, the port on the bottom on which you normally control the keyboard, uh, c connect the keyboard and the mouse, but other things can be connected there as well. So it basically manages um, those two ports. Also, the display on the surface is very nice, and part of that is because there's a whole bunch of display calibration and color calibration that's also done by SAM. So SAM is a Kinetis ARM processor. So Kinetis is one of the, uh, the vendor that makes the system on chip. Um, it's a Cortex-M4, so you know, it's not like a one gigahertz you know, A8 or something like that. Um, and I believe it's a KL27. There's basically a whole uh, bunch of processor families. Uh, it, at least on the one I have it, I think it's a KL27. And it runs um, its own custom real-time operating system called KOS, which actually is, that's the typo there. It's spelled like this, chaos. Um, at first I thought it was KOS from Kinetis OS, so I wanted to look at the Kinetis SDK to see if they just kind of used one of the RTOSs that Kinetis provides. Um, but I didn't see any similar source code to what I was seeing in binary. So it looks like it's a completely custom OS um, that Microsoft um, has written, KOS or Chaos. Um, and it can talk to the main processor, it can talk to DC. In the latest firmware, which is about 200 kilobytes, um, I, you know, IDA was able to identify 1,282 functions. So a lot of code goes in there. And I reversed about 939 of them. Um, I kind of stopped when it got to do super complex math with sensor aggregation. So as soon as we got to code that had to do with like multiplying the gyroscope value by the accelerometer XYZ axis, I'm like, I'm not interested in that. Um, so I didn't fully reverse the whole thing, but you know, got, got pretty close. Now, um, as I mentioned, SAM does color calibration. It aggregates sensor data. So the surface has an accelerometer. It has an ambient light sensor. It has a gyroscope. It has a magnometer. Um, it can also take actions based on that data. It can also aggregate the data and send it to other components on a system. And then these two ports, um, one of them is called Blade, which I think is the one at the bottom, and the other one's called Surface Link or SurfLink. So it also manages um, those two ports. And there's also an authentication chip. Um, similar to how um, Apple has a whole protocol for authenticating accessories, um, the Blade and, and SurfLink ports have an authentication chip as well. And there's some SHA hashes and HMACs, um, I guess, so that you don't like, connect um, you know, non-Microsoft approved accessories to, to these ports. So it manages kind of authentication um, around that. So as soon as I looked at the binary, um, you know, when I finally figured out how to kind of uh, disassemble the firmware, and we'll talk about that, you know, there's some interesting strings in there, like um, enabling the embedded controllers PCH DBGEN, which if you look at Intel chipset documentation, is, a, is an interesting um, pin to, to be able to strap on. Um, and there's some uh, file names in there as well. So, you know, C builds Peregrine, SAM builds Peregrine, ship M1. What I really find hilarious, though, is that, of course, the code is under, you know, accessory source blade, main source power management, sensor source, all under application. But then that entire source tree is called under, is under a directory called POC. So I don't know if it started as a proof of concept and then it just grew into an entire thing, or if POC means something else, but I just thought it was hilarious that... Uh, it's, 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 all, it's all one big proof of concept. So let's kind of talk about um, what, what SAM can do, how the OS works, and, and kind of how you can talk to SAM. So KOS basically um, runs in, in a supervisor mode on ARM. So just like Intel processors, we have, a, we have a user mode and we have supervisor mode. And it provides a few simple system calls um, around tasks, semaphores, and queues. And it also has a timer interface, um, but the timers are actually done in user mode. 
So tasks are basically like threads. Um, they can be created, they have a priority, and they have a deadline. So basically the RTOS just switches between the various tasks and the task can wait on another task. Very, very simple, kind of cooperative uh, scheduling with, with kind of preemption based on priority and deadlines. Um, then the semaphores can basically be acquired, released, and, and waited on. So this lets different tasks synchronize among each other, uh, specifically when doing I.O. And then there's queues, which are typically used when uh, you want to share information between an interrupt and a task. So if an interrupt comes in with some data um, that a task is interested in, the interrupt code can put it into a queue, and later on the task can do the service, the system call to retrieve the data from the queue. So very, very basic OS um, um, that you, know, you, you could write in an RTOS class. Now what's interesting is it has a whole um, IO model as well. So there's a whole device um, API with callbacks and device names. And there's um, open, close, read, write, and ioctal. So it has a kind of simple device model. Um, and you start with six devices, LPU art, which is low power serial port, um, LPU art one watt, flex IO UART, uh, flex IO I squared C, UART one watt, and I squared C. So there's kind of a, an I squared C device uh, serial port device, and then Flex I/O I think is the um, the Kinetis name for uh, flexible I/O port that can be configured in, in in multiple modes. Then later on they created a device called USL and UBL, which um, I know the S is related to Surface Link and the B is related to Blade, but I haven't really figured out what the U is or, or kind of what specifically um, those devices do. And then it's got about 12 tasks running. It's got a CLI task which actually gives you a serial command line interface. So there's actually a terminal inside of SAM, which is fun. Um, there's an event task for events. There's an EC task for talking to the embedded controller. Um, SAR and SNR manage sensors, power. Um, there's a HID task, as we're going to see, because this is a HID device. There's an authentication task, a surface link task, a blade task, um, something they call Fusion, which appears to be the code name of the uh, magnometer, and then the UPS and UBP tasks, which again, I'm not sure what they do. I know they're related to Blade um, and, and, and Surflink. So it's a whole bunch of kind of tasks or, or components that are running inside uh, KOS and, and managing various parts of the Surface. Now, what's really interesting is all of Surface, if you look at its entire firmware stack from EFI to EC to um, SAM, have a concept of a runtime mode. So there's an EFI driver which controls this, detects what kind of mode you should be in, and then it configures the EC to run in that mode, and then the EC tells SAM what the mode should be as well. And the two runtime modes are customer mode, which is the mode you're normally in, and then manufacturing mode. Um, and of course, like all devices, when you have a manufacturing mode, that's when things get interesting. Um, one of the things I realized is very similar to the Apple SMC, which had a set of commands and a set of behaviors when you were in normal mode, and then you had to put that Harry Potter password, if you'll remember, to go in like the Apple super secret sauce mode. Um, Surface is very similar. It has a bunch of commands in customer mode, but if you can unlock manufacturing mode, um, then, then, then commands get a lot more interesting. So in manufacturing mode, you get about 100 different commands over the CLI, over the serial port interface. Um, and these include things like factory tests, uh, full access to all GPIO pins, full access to the entire I2C bus. Um, you can acquire and aggregate data from any sensor, and you can send raw packets, raw data to any device you want. It also kind of has an internal uh, debugging interface, so you can read and write anywhere in SAM memory. Um, there's a debug log, there's tracing capabilities. Um, you can even get KOS to like dump all the tasks, to dump all the heaps. So there's diagnostics and debugging in KOS, and you can also flash anything you want um, through this interface in manufacturing mode. So just to show you some, some strings, for example, um, because you know, there's, like, there's a little help you can put in the command line interface and it dumps you what all the commands are. Um, you know, I, for example, swim I. So all sorts of um, you know, things you can do by, by typing them over a serial port once you can talk um, to Sam that way. Now, unfortunately, if you're in customer mode, you only get three commands. I, which is who am I? And it just tells you this is SAM, uh, gives it a SAM version. T, which lets you turn on full tracing or disable tracing. Um, and ASL, which is detect surface link device. This basically tells you what you plug in on a surface link port. So if you have a, a PSU, it'll tell you like what kind of power charge is plugged in. If you have other things, you know, it'll just basically tell you what did it detect connected um, on the side of the device. So nothing super interesting unless you go in manufacturing mode. 
Now, the CLI is one way to talk to Sam, but it's not super interesting to me because that requires actually having a serial interface to Sam itself. Um, there's obviously no serial port on the surface, so you have to figure out a way to um, get the serial pins out of one of these two ports. And that obviously implies a, a hardware attack, like a physical person would have to like plug something in your surface and like start reconfiguring SAM. Um, so that's not super interesting. What I wanted to see is can I talk to SAM in software? And the answer, of course, is yes. First of all, if you can own the EC, the EC can talk to SAM. Uh, but that requires owning the EC, and you know, that's a whole other presentation for another day. Um, so the entire command set, actually, that we want to get to is available over a protocol called HID. And Windows knows how to speak HID, so does Linux, so does NEOS. And through HID, you can actually talk to SAM. Um, and, and that was very interesting because I didn't know that um, HID existed over, over non-USB devices. So talk a little bit about HID and what it is, and specifically how come the SAM is, is a HID device. Um, so HID was uh, a standard created as part of something in Microsoft called Project Raptor, uh, Raptor, and it stands for Human Interface Device. And the idea is to basically have reports and descriptors provided by a device that explain different packages and usages the device has. Um, and when it was introduced over USB, this was meant to allow things like joysticks, uh, keyboards, mice, remotes, anything with a bunch of buttons or a bunch of like axes, axes or toggles or switches to be able to describe all the toggles that it has, all the axes that it supports, all the buttons. Um, so you can think, you know, this pro probably came out of like Microsoft Sidewinder division, you know, they made awesome joysticks, tons of buttons, tons of toggles and everything. HID was a way that these devices could easily explain all the capabilities and it was a whole standard with a parser that um, the OS would have to then basically parse all these HID descriptors. Um, HID is a nightmare, like the standard is just super confusing and parsing HID descriptors is, is just really, really bad. Um, and there have been bugs in, in like open source operating systems. I haven't seen a lot of like Windows HID parsing O days, which either means that you know, the Microsoft HID parsing code, which of course is in kernel mode, like everything Microsoft does, um, is really, really good, and it might be because they kind of invented HID, or maybe people should look at HID parsing bugs more, but I'm not here to talk about HID that much. Now, originally, eventually I knew that HID um, got exposed over Bluetooth as well. For example, Wiimotes um, have our basically HID devices over Bluetooth, um, and then Microsoft actually created like a serial port HID for some of their media center PCs. But in Windows 8, it actually turns out that they um, created this new standard called HID over I2C, which is you know, the, the low power um, serial, well not, yeah, serial bus that, um, SO, that system on chips use. And in Windows 8, there's a whole HID over I2C stack that allows uh, kernel mode and user mode devices to talk to that. And more and more laptops now and, and tablets take advantage of this. For example, the traditional way of, of your laptop's USB keyboard and touchpad um, to connect it to the traditional way to connect that to the OS was to either make them PS2 devices, and of course this meant having all that legacy PS2 stuff in your laptop, or to make them USB devices. Um, but USB is, you know, pretty heavy-handed protocol for something as simple as a keyboard or a touchpad, um, and newer devices now are actually putting this over I2C. So, um, you know, Microsoft actually did, did a really interesting here, really interesting thing here by by migrating that over. So. The way things, works in, things work in HID is you have something called reports. And there's three types of reports that you can send. Input reports, output reports, and feature reports. Now, input reports are when the device talks to the host. Output reports are when the host talks to the device. And feature reports are kind of bi-directional, um, but they're normally used when you use the host want to send something to the device, and then the device can return right away. With output, you send something and then you have to wait for an input. With feature, it's basically bi-directional. You send a feature, and by the time the feature returns, there's some data in there. Now, a hit device is going to expose collections, and a collection is basically a set of controls and usages. So if you have, let's say, a, um, a hit device that's both a touchpad and a keyboard, um, it's a single hit device, but it's going to expose a keyboard collection, which has all of the usages that explain all the buttons, and it's going to expose a mouse collection, which explains kind of the touchpad and the buttons on a touchpad. And what a Windows does is for each collection, it creates a physical device object or a PDO. So even though this is one hardware device, 
Every collection is treated kind of as a, as a functional device on a PCI bus, let's say. And so you get a different device stack for, for all of these things. Um, so here's a diagram from Microsoft just to kind of explain how it all works. So you have basically uh, what Microsoft calls SPB, which is the Serial Peripheral Bus Driver. So this includes things like uh, I2C and uh, SPI, things, th things like that. Specifically, there's a, a HID I2C driver on top of that. And then on top of the HID I2C driver, you have your normal um, HID parser, the HID class device, and then obviously if it detects a keyboard or a mouse, then it loads the keyboard stack or the mouse stack um, or anything else like that. So it's basically a protocol on top of a bus that lets you discover and expose devices um, like mice and keyboards. But they don't have to be mice, keyboards, and joysticks. Like SAM is not a keyboard or a mouse or, or a joystick uh, or a remote or anything like that, but it's a generic protocol that you can use to, to exchange commands. So I guess because they invented it, um, they made SAM kind of talk over this, this protocol. Now, unlike real USB devices, which can be discovered and scanned for, um, hit over I2C requires some ACPI special sauce. Because an I2C bus doesn't get discovered, you kind of have to hard code it somewhere in the device descriptors. So in ACPI, you have to have a, a code there that exposes the device, and you have what the ACPI standard calls um, a device-specific method, which has that GUID. This is all in the ACPI standard, and this is supposed to return something called the HID descriptor address. Once I have the HID descriptor address, I can query it, and I get back a HID descriptor, which gives me the input address that I can use to get input descriptors, the output address, which I can use to send output descriptors, um, and then the command and data register accesses, which I can use to send uh, features and to get data back from there as well. So there's a whole standard and specification here that explains how all this works. Um, Linux actually has um, an open source um, hit I2C driver as well. And in the references section of the slides, I have links um, to all of this. So in ACPI, if you dump the ACPI tables of, of a service machine, you're going to see a device there called SAM um, with this hardware ID that identifies itself as a HID protocol device over I squared C. And um, it has then some methods there that, that begin describing the device. One of them, which is not in this screenshot, is going to be that DSM, which is going to return um, that on SAM, its HID descriptor address is address 1. Um, and then the Windows stack can basically uh, enumerate and expose these, this device. So if I go in Device Manager, uh, SAM actually shows up there. Um, it's not going to show up as SAM. It's basically going to show up as uh, I squared C hid device, right? So it's it's kind of very generic, but um, that's that's basically SAM right there. All right. So as I mentioned, over register one, so that's an I squared C um, you know uh, terminology. It exposes the hid descriptor, and if you query that, you'll see that the report descriptor is on register two. Inputs on three, outputs on four, commands on five, data on six. Um, you don't actually have to worry about any of these things because the Windows I squared C hit stack uh, does it for you. But for example, if you were um, in EFI mode, like I was, and talking, trying to talk to Sam from EFI directly, um, I had to figure all this stuff out so that I can actually talk to it over I squared C myself. Because in EFI, there's no, um, there's no hit stack. In uh, Windows, though, you know, Windows queries all this data, it figures it all out for you, and, and you don't really have to worry about it. All right, so how do I actually talk to SAM over HID? Well, one way is to send an output descriptor. And every output descriptor must have a report ID, and the report ID that SAM uses is 14 or 0xe. Then you can give it a command code from 0 to 48 hex. And there's you know, 40 different commands that, that it supports. Another way to talk to it is through a feature descriptor. So you can also uh, send a feature descriptor and then the command codes can be between 20 and 3a. So if you follow the output mechanism, there's a different set of commands there. With the feature mechanism, there is a different set of commands. And there's also a set feature instead of get feature, which has uh, commands between 0 and 8. And those are just directly reported as the report ID and 20 to 2a. So it's kind of like three interfaces um, into SAM. I guess they kind of se separated um, you know, internal debugging from like sensor acquisition from, from other things in there. And I'll show you some examples of that. So how do we talk to hit device? Um, well, all you need is a simple user mode application, and then you just have to call create file. Now, with create file, you need to know the uh, device path 
of, the, of this device. And it's going to be messy. Um, and you have to use all these setup API, um, you know, setup API uh, APIs to get it. But basically, it'll look like something like this at the end of the day. And you don't have to hard code this or memorize this. There's, there's APIs that will query it for you. Um, and then this GUID here at the end, that's what tells Windows that this is a hit I squared C device. And then MS Hardware 0030, that's the device ID for SAM. That's what you saw on the ACPI tables. So that specifically is SAM on the I squared C bus. And then there's a call zero and then some number there. That's the collection. So SAM exposes three collections. Uh, collection one, I'm actually not quite sure what it's used for. Collection two is the one through which you can send output reports, and all those 40 commands are available there. Collection three is th through which you can send feature reports. So if you want to send some commands to SAM, you have to, use, you have to open a handle to um, collection three. Other commands, need to, you need to send, um, send those over collection number two. So of course, as soon as you call create file, Windows is going to be doing an access check. Um, and I was curious, you know, do I have to be admin to talk to SAM? Do I have to be a system? What are the permissions? Um, and you can use, you know, amazing tool, um, access check from sysinternals. And from sysinternals, we can see that system has all access, administrators have all access, and everyone has add, add ex append, execute, list, read, 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 traverse, write. I mean, this is basically all access, but without actually putting all access. Um, and restricted has, you know, read. Um, so everyone can basically read and write uh, to Sam. And not just everyone, but the integrity level, if you're familiar with that, is low. So anyone at low IL can just send commands to Sam. Um, that was kind of interesting. But I wonder, well, I wonder what commands Sam actually supports. You know, what can I do over HID? Well, the first command is firmware update. <laughs> cool, cool, yeah, great. Um, so I figured, okay, well, I'm just getting started. You know, hopefully you can't actually upgrade the firmware from low integrity running as everyone. Um, and then there's you know other commands, including one which I thought was funny, which is disable firmware update. So I was like, well, I hope someone calls that pretty early. Um, and there's you know stress test, USB config, self test, VS Combi blade mode, which you know makes your surface turn into a transformer. Um, you know, uh, this was really fun to look at. So I'm like, okay, man, let's, let's see what all these commands do. Let, let's learn um, and kind of see how they work. So how do we send out a command? Um, well, if you use the output interface, once you have a handle with create file, you call write file. So it's just like writing into a file. And then the first byte you send has to be the report ID. And for Sam, that's report ID 0x8. Then the next um, buffer byte has to contain the command function, kind of shifted by one, so the command goes in bits seven to one, because the bottom bit um, describes whether you're trying to get something with this command or set something with this command. Most commands only support one of the two modes. Um, some will support both. So for example, um, if I look in, in the firmware, I can see that there's a command, which is command 14 hex, to reset the watchdog. So I take 14 hex, shift it, um, the other, you know, shift it by the other way, and then or in zero, which means you know, it's, a, it's a get command um, in this case. And this is my report ID. And then I just call write file on the handle I obtained to the hit device. And this, for example, resets the watchdog. Right? That's not, not super interesting, but use my first, you know, I want to start something small before sending like flash of firmware. Um, this command is kind of a, a one-shot command, like you don't get a response back. But some commands do send you response back. So how do you get a response? Well, an output report goes to the device, so you need an input report. And to get input reports, you don't call read file. I don't know why the hit API is designed this way. To, to send data, you call write file. To read data, you call get input report. Um, and when you do that, again, in the first element of the buffer, you have to tell it what uh, report ID you want. So since we just sent report uh, 14, we want to read report 14. And then in your buffer, basically, you'll, you'll get the response back. Um, and at least the way Sam does it, um, buffer 2 usually con contains like a response code, like uh, an, an I squared C level response code. So did Sam actually get the message? Was Sam able to do something? And then buffer 3 and onwards then contain the actual, the actual data. Um, so in this screenshot, I, I forgot, whoops, I forgot what I sent. Um, but I, I wanted to read a response from it. Sorry for pressing escape there. Um, so the response was kind of the first byte of the input report, which starts at um, index number 3. 
So that's with the output and input mechanism. But other commands that Sam has uh, are done through features. And features are bidirectional. So, um, and there's no kind of um, report ID there to worry about. So you can buffer zero, you kind of put the command you want, and then you call hit D get feature. Um, this sends, you know, whatever your request is. In this case, it's get SAM version. And then in feature buffer, once this call returns, I'll have the SAM version there, because code 25 is, is how you can get the, the version back. So get features um, kind of does a read and a, a write and a read for you um, in a single command. Now the other interesting thing that I, that I realized when I was looking at this is not only can you talk to from, from anywhere you want in user mode, but they actually have an ACPI method, and I never saw anyone use ACPI this way, which is pretty interesting, um, that they called SCMD. Uh, Microsoft ACPI tables also have an internal like printf, and it's really nice to have like debug logs in ACPI, um, which also most vendors don't do. And this basically, uh, you know, ACPI code is, is annoying to read, but this basically has like a prefixed buffer that's actually like a, a hard-coded, you know, beef, um, a hard-coded I squared C packet, and it updates byte number C, so 89ABC here, with whatever um, you, you send as the command to this, to this method. So basically, you can kind of send a, a hard-coded uh, I squared C packet with whatever command you want to SAM uh, from ACPI. And obviously, ACPI is exposed to user mode as well through other interfaces. Um, this doesn't let you read the data back. Um, it doesn't let you, you know, customize what that buffer is. But I thought it was interesting that there's like a, an ACPI backdoor almost to, to send commands um, to SAM that way. So that, that was a little bit interesting there. All right, so um, let's actually do a little demo of how with Visual Studio I can talk to Sam. And one of the commands that uh, are exposed over, over HID uh, is a command get debug log entry. So we can actually read the internal debug log um, of Sam, and they trace everywhere. Like half of this binary is tracing code and debugging log code, which, which is really nice. Um, and obviously I can understand that as a hardware designer. Uh, you know, you have an embedded device, you want to make sure you know what's, what's going on with it um, at all times. So I basically reversed um, how this, that hit command works specifically. Um, and basically here what you're going to see is whoops, whoa, uh, report ID E, again 14, meaning I want to send a command. And 21 is really 10, shifted 1 or 1, um, which means get debug log entry. And then there's multiple kinds of debug log entries you can get. There's a code for get the first entry. There's a code for get the last entry. Um, get, there's a code for get the uh, next to last entry. And there's a code for get the, sec, uh, get the after the next entry. So basically, you can either read from the end and, keep then, and then keep reading um, to the beginning, or you can start at the beginning and then read till the end. Uh, I forgot which, one, which code is which. Um, and what this should be doing then is we should be seeing strings coming out from, from Sam if, uh, if everything works well. So let's see if I can hit my breakpoint here. Okay. So let's see if I have a handle. Yep. Okay, so that should be getting. So it's, it gets an input report, and then it basically printfs uh, what it gets from Sam character by character. Uh, so I'll just kind of let it run and see what happens. So these are all coming from Sam. Yes, I, I guess I'm going from bottom to top. Um, these strings are strings that basically Sam is internally printing into itself. And the first numbers, uh, one of these numbers is basically which component inside of Sam has, has printed that. Um, and then this is, I think, a timestamp or, or something. I couldn't quite figure that out. Um, here it looks like we're getting power state changes. Uh, obviously, one of the things Sam does is monitor, you know, me plugging it in, plugging it out, battery life. Um, and I thought this was kind of interesting uh, from a uh, forensics point of view because this log, actually, I can keep it going. It has like 50,000 entries. It's actually written in, in the Sam flash. So pretty much from like when I bought the Surface until this log gets full, which, you know, could be like a megabyte, uh, it's going to show like every USB device I plugged in and out, every time I unplug or plug the keyboard, every time I plug the power adapter, what kind of power adapter I had. Um, and yeah, I thought forensic, this is pretty interesting, um, pretty interesting data. For example, one of the things here is 
uh, saying that I plugged in the combi, which is, the com which is how they call the combo um, keyboard and, and mouse. And this was the firmer version of the combi. Um, you know, then there was a power change, uh, five volts got plugged in. Some of the output appears corrupt, and that's, that's not a fault of my tool. That's how it's actually in the, um, in, in the device for some reason. Uh, other things that uh, this monitors is the lid, so closing and opening the lid. So you can see here that um, it got what they call the hall interrupt. The hall is the device they use for um, monitoring the, the lid. It's the, mag the, the magnet there. So I closed the lid here, and I opened the lid here, for example. Um, you know, what else? UART, I'm trying to see if it sees when I plugged in my, um, my actual power charger. Should show like something around there. There we go. Um, detected, interrupt, disconnected 31 watt power supply, which is the standard kind of surface power supply uh, you get. So, and what I really like is it detects if I attached it straight or if I attach it reverse. It actually judges you if you plug it in the wrong way. Um, so you can actually see which ways you, you, you plugged it in. Um, so you can see, you know, which, which way I usually do that. And then the power change. Anyway, if I just leave it running, just so you can see how many um, event logs there are, we, you know, you could stay here, like, all, all day long. It's just going to keep on going. Uh, last time I checked, I had about 8,000 entries. And I can't read them too quickly. Like, I actually have to put sleeps all over the place, because obviously I square C is a very slow bus. So this is actually the fastest I can get to read from it. So it literally takes, like, 15 minutes to dump the whole log. Um, Anyway, I'll stop it here. So that's all, you know, one of the things we can do um, with, with the hit commands, just read this log. Now, the more interesting thing, of course, how does the firmware update process work on this thing? So basically, with Windows 10, Microsoft started uh, very strongly to push vendors to do firmware upgrades over Windows Update, which is actually a pretty good thing, because then it means instead of having to like download various BIOS updates or have some sort of special Dell tool, um, it can all come from, from Windows Update directly. And specifically with Surface, they're following their own guidelines and they're publishing almost every month uh, firmware upgrades. For example, the Surface Pro 4, there's a whole page where you can see every firmware upgrade every month that was pushed. So here's January 18, which is not the latest one, but it was a pretty big one. Had a Surface Pro firmware update uh, to the keyboard, I think. Uh, Intel uh, touch device upgrade, an upgrade to the Surface integration service device, uh, Surface integration, storage firmware update driver, Surface embedded controller firmware, and then Surface system aggregator. And they actually, in this month in January, there was an EFI upgrade, there was a SAM upgrade, there was an EC upgrade, there was a touch controller upgrade, there was, you know, there's a lot of firmware in this device. Um, like most devices, but just like Apple, Microsoft is doing a really good job at upgrading that firmware. Um, if you actually look at like all the firmwares that that's that are in a in a in a Surface, there's a nice uh, screenshot from Microsoft's website there that kind of explains how it all works. Um, I love it how you know people ignore firmware, but all of these things in most laptops have upgradable firmware, and they could all you know in the Surface case, for example, come through Windows Update. So, you know, there's code here, there's code here, there's code here, there's code here, code here, code here. All of these sensors can have code as well. Um, and Microsoft has a whole standard on how you update those, those firmware devices um, on your SOC. So basically, you have this, this table called an ESRT. Um, you describe which of your embedded devices are up, uh, firmware upgradable. And then when you get the Windows update, it has an INF, like a Windows driver would. It has the actual binary blob and has a catalog file. And the catalog file signs the binary blob and the INF. So they're all signed with you know, the standard Microsoft um, driver signature. And then when you basically double click and install that INF or go through the Windows Update, it goes to what's called the um, EFI capsule format. Now, EFI capsules are the EFI standard way of upgrading firmware, whether it's EFI firmware or firmware belonging to some other device. So there's a <clears throat> update capsule API that gets called through the HAL, and the capsule file gets basically uploaded into firmware, and then the machine reboots, and at the reboot, the firmware upgrade is going to happen. But these um, Microsoft Surface capsules aren't normal capsules. 
normal capsules have some code in them, and there's some EFI specific things about how they work. Um, these capsules looked a little bit different. They didn't have any code in them. They didn't have any EFI code in them. They had weird headers I didn't recognize. So I spent about two weeks reverse engineering the format, the header, how it all worked, building my own capsules. Um, and then a friend of mine who looks at firmware at Microsoft said, yeah, you're, you're, you're going to hate us. And I said, why, why? Said, Just wait a few weeks. Um, and end of April, actually April 27th, a day after my birthday, which I wonder if that was on purpose, uh, they published all of this on GitHub. So there's an official Microsoft EFI project on GitHub where they have any um, changes to EFI that they've made in the Surface EFI firmware themselves. Because the Surface EFI actually has a bunch of additions to the normal EDK2 package. Um, Microsoft's hope is to like integrate all of these changes into the Intel official EDK, um, but until that happens, they actually have a fork of EDK2 and they just open source all these things, which is pretty cool for, of them to have done that. Um, so of course, once you get the whole, uh, up, uh, the whole capsule header out, you strip it all out, you strip the signature out, and you get to the actual SAM firmware, um, I look to see, okay, what kind of firmware is it? Because that's kind of what I started with. I'm not the typical hardware guy. I didn't decap the SAM and like read it with a microscope. I just started looking at the published firmware because as soon as the vendor publishes firmware, it's usually easier to grab that than to get it directly from the device. So I started looking for like SREC, Motorola, Intel Hex, you know, the usual things I recognize when looking for embedded firmware. Um, didn't recognize anything. It was all binary. And then I have this stupid little trick where I just kind of play with the number of columns hex that it shows me until I can see a pattern. Like, is this a bitmap? What does it look like? Um, and I hit, yeah, I was almost giving up, but then I finally hit the jackpot with like 24, uh, 24 hex columns. And you can kind of see just in the ASCII, um, you know, there's, there's like a little pattern here, right? There's some nulls and then it's like, oh, this looks interesting. Um, and then of course, once you look at it in hex, well, these are ever increasing addresses starting at 4,000 hex. Um, they're all increasing by 20 bytes hex, 20 byte hex, 20 byte hex. Um, there's a space here, um, which kind of sounds like 20, because that sounds like 20 bytes, 20 bytes, 20 bytes. And then what do I have here? Well, exactly 20 hex, 32 bytes. So very simple format. Address in flash, where this line is going to get uploaded, uh, length of this line, and then the actual binary data. Eventually, I found the upgrader in the EFI, uh, I dumped the EFI firmware and I eventually found the, the DXC which actually does the firmware upgrade and I could have also just figured it out that way. Um, but anyway, pretty simple format so I just kind of stripped out this data, rebuilt the binary file, loaded an IDA, gave it a start address of 4000 and then, you know, spend the next uh, seven months reverse engineering 939 functions. So when EFI starts up, uh, because there's a capsule pending, it starts in this like flash upgrade mode. And this is actually pretty cool because then the DXCs that Microsoft wrote to do the flash upgrade recognize this boot as being done as part of a flash upgrade, not as part of a, just a standard boot. Um, then they also will uh, have an event that they wait for called ready to boot OS. And when ready to boot OS happens, they'll lock down the EFI protocols for doing an update. So EFI with this Microsoft standard will only let you flash firmware if you're in firmware flashing mode, which means the OS has had to have had uh, uploaded a signed capsule and you rebooted because of a capsule, not just because of a normal reboot. And as soon as the OS boots, all these protocols are removed and EFI will no longer um, allow you to flash. Now, since it's all on GitHub, you can even see this. Um, you know, if we've locked the device, don't pass through, should be blocked by hardware. So the function that does the uh, firmware upgrade in EFI will return access denied. Um, if you're basically not in the right code path, or if the OS is already ready to boot, or any EFI binary. So if you have secure boot turned on, um, you won't be able to cause EFI to upgrade this in any other way. Now the upgrader has a function called set image, which actually does the SAM firmware upgrade. And even though the catalog file was signed and the capsule was signed, there's another signature in the firmware itself. So the file is basically double signed. There's the signature to get it through Windows Update and to get, it, to get the OS to upload us the capsule. There's a signature to get EFI to load it. And then there's the signature to actually, where Microsoft actually verifies the firmware file itself is, is, is trusted. Um, interesting to, to realize here is that SAM itself doesn't verify the signature of the file. So this is EFI verifying that signature. And then it talks over I squared C in EFI mode. Um, it uses the hit command you saw on the screenshot earlier, firmware upgrade. 
it sends an output report with various flags, and then it'll start basically uh, upgrading the firmware. Now, SAM itself has a lockdown mode, which prevents it from being upgraded unless it's when it should be upgraded. And I'll talk about how the, how the lockdown mode works. So um, the, DXC, the, 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 the driver that does the update in the FI mode is obviously signed. The image is signed. And there's also additional checks when doing the upgrade to see if you have enough battery life, if the machine is not too hot. And also there's version checks and rollback prevention. So the firmware upgrade mechanism is actually really, really robust um, and, and really, really well done. Now, lockdown mode is what SAM itself uses to make sure you're not updating it outside of when it's supposed to be updated, aka an EFI, right? Because your, your CPU knows it's, e, it's an EFI, but SAM's not in your CPU. How, how does it know that we're in the right stage where it should be updated? So there's a hit command to disable firmware upgrades. And the EC also tells SAM when it's okay to accept a firmware upgrade and when it's not okay to, to um, accept a firmware upgrade. And basically, only the EC can release lockdown mode. When SAM starts up, it starts in lockdown mode. The uh, EC can then tell it to disable lockdown mode, and then the EC can later re-enable it again, or there's a hit command to re-enable it again as well. So the way it works, um, if you want to flash this thing, is there's an operation code in buffer two. You can begin flash, you can write flash, and you can end flash. Interestingly, th there's also a code for verifying flash. So although you can't dump the firmware of your current device, if you provide the firmware file from Microsoft that you think you have, you can actually verify every line of flash matches what's inside your, your device. Um, and that one, unfortunately, also does require lockdown mode to be removed. So you can't, like, you're not supposed to be able to do it if you, if you can't also update the flash. And then you put the offset in the next four bytes, you put the length in the next byte, and then the data. And this is basically just a, an IDA screenshot of the function inside SAM that does the firmware upgrade. Um, and no, you know, there were no symbol files. These, these, this is all the names that I had to come up with. Um, so you can see here there's a check to see if you're in lockdown mode or not. And if you are in lockdown mode, this just returns zero. It won't do any of the logic that's here. So obviously I was interested in, is there a way to get rid of that lockdown mode? Well, when the EC wakes up, the SAM wakes up, lockdown is on by default. Then if you're actually rebooting the machine, basically on, on a main CPU power on, the EC detects that, it tells SAM, hey, the, the CPU is powering on, turn, turn off lockdown mode because there might be a firmware upgrade coming. Then EFI will check if we're booting or if we're just upgrading firmware. If we are booting, it's then going to send a command to, uh, through HID or the EC will send it to re-enable lockdown mode. So only at boot very early, you get a period where, the, where they're syncing it flashed. Otherwise, if we are in flash update mode, lockdown is going to stay off because no one's going to turn it back on. We're going to flash the SAM. The flash is going to finish. Then the machine reboots after the flash is done. And now we go back to the boot phase again, and lockdown gets turned on. So this looked uh, pretty solid. Because assuming that secure boot is turned on, this entire process should be foolproof. Um, from, from a software attack perspective. The update is signed. Um, you can't do an update without putting it in reboot due to flash upgrade, because otherwise the EFI code will not do an upgrade. Secure boot means you can't run other EFI code. It means you can't patch that EFI code in any way. And lockdown mode on SAM itself guarantees that you can't uh, upgrade the flash after this has, has ended. And I verified it. I tried sending it uh, the, the firmer flash commands. For my, little, for my little tool, and I wasn't able to do it because it was in lockdown mode. Now, of course, this is an Alex presentation, so there's always a design flaw somewhere. Um, there is a way, without rebooting, without EFI, to disable that lockdown mode, um, which I actually only realized uh, very recently, and I did promise a friend that if I found anything actually dangerous, I wouldn't publicize it without telling them, and since I only found out a week ago that this actually worked, I'm not going to show you how I did it, um, but I will do a demo of, I know, I want Microsoft to know first, obviously, so people don't uh, flash people's firmwares from like a browser, because keep in mind, the HID device lets everyone at low IL talk to it. So, you know, browser exploit could flash, your, flash SAM, which, which is not a great thing. Um, so I'm going to go back in my code here, and you know, I have a, enable the stuff that does the firmware upgrade. 
do, 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 do. let's see. So let's see, this update hopefully will work. And keep that off. And maybe I want this. I, I'm lost in my own code. There we go, so I probably want that. And let's do that as well. Who knows what will happen? I'll just run this and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens to my machine, I guess. All right, hit run. All right, let's flash this thing. Okay. It actually says, do you want to switch the device to tablet mode? Uh, line error, that's not good. Flash erased, uh-oh. Oh, well, that, that, oh that, that line had an error. The rest looks like it's fine. So it is, okay, maybe something got, something, sometimes if I talk through too quickly, it'll give an error and then it just retries. So anyway, it looks like it's working. Of course, I could just be printing dots in a loop, making you think it's upgrading firmware. So you kind of have to take my word for it. Um, but this is, you know, upda updating uh, the SAM firmware and it, it should eventually end without any errors. Uh, I'll, I'll keep going and then it should hit that breakpoint and, and we'll see if there's anything else in there. So. Um, now, if, the good thing about this is the hardware design is really amazing. Um, if you screw up anywhere, you, you'll see because basically your keyboard and touchpad stop working and you can't rotate the device anymore. Um, but a few seconds later, it basically comes back on again because it has a bootloader that can't be flashed, or at least I haven't figured out how, and that bootloader basically keeps a copy of the working old firmware and then puts it back in case there's an issue. So you can't actually brick SAM. Uh, at least I haven't figured out a way how and I'm not interested in bricking my own SAM um, because it will recover if it doesn't like the firmware. If the, the checksum is invalid, um, you know, if, if, if it doesn't boot up, um, it will it'll go back to normal. So um, hopefully you know, that's something Microsoft will, will, will want to fix um, if they care about it. So to kind of wrap up here, um, you know, people keep ignoring embedded MCUs and, and socks on their PCs. They all think about, you know, firmware and EFI and the BIOS. A lot of people don't realize there's all these other chips out there. Um, back when the Guardian had to destroy uh, Snowden's computer, you know, this was one of those pictures. And tons of people on Reddit were like, oh, they overdid it. Like that chip is just like next to the battery. All it does is, you know, control the charger. Why, you know, destroy that? I'm like, yeah, that's the EC. Trust me, there's a reason you destroy that. Um, there's all these components with code on it that kind of get ignored, and many of them are, f are firmware upgradable, uh, you know, from user mode. So uh, pay attention to firmware. Now, SAM itself is a really powerful coprocessor. So, you know, if you have malicious code running in there, that's obviously pretty neat. Um, there's an exposed serial port, right? So if you plug in the right kind of device, you could, you could have your own command line interface. Um, and even though this whole firmware upgrade process is, is secure, it's well thought out, it's signed, uh, it looked really great, there was one tiny little design flaw they didn't think about. Um, and of course, now I can up, update the firmware from, uh, from user mode. Um, the other weird thing is really any process, even low integrity, can, can talk to HID. Um, that, that seems kind of insecure. I mean, I understand why, especially now that browsers need like, there's a whole USB standard, so browsers in JavaScript can talk to USB devices, but at some point it'd be nice if we like stopped this, uh, this madness. Oh, looks like it's done. Uh, and again, do I want to switch to tablet mode? I would zoom in, but I can't press control one for a few seconds until it comes back up online, uh, which should be now. Anyway, so it's done. Um, I don't think there were any errors. See, two, two, two. Flash updated, resetting SAM. So, you know, I just updated back with itself. Like, I didn't put any malicious firm or anything like that. Trust me. Um, and, and, yeah, that was that. Now, I haven't, I've started looking at the EC as well. The EC is uh, 8051 code, and I hate reading 8051 code. Uh, I wish hex rays would just let me decompile it. Um, but it has some pretty interesting uh, strings in there as well in the EC firmware. Um, EFI top swap testing, if you know what EFI top swap is, that's an interesting one. Uh, enable firmware update, disable firmware update. Um, again, others, traps and things like that on the board, enable test mode. So the EC has its own command line interface, it has its own way of talking to it, um, and I'm still kind of slowly working out um, how, to, how to mess around with the EC. So as soon as these slides are up, um, you'll have some of the references here. Uh, there's a whole guide from Microsoft explaining how hit over I2C works. There's a specification um, on GitHub. There's the whole EFI capsule implementation. And Linux has a hit I2C driver as well, which was really, really helpful 
in terms of understanding how to, how to talk um, over this protocol and how the Windows APIs uh, kind of map to that. So um, that's pretty much it. Thanks for coming. Um, and let me know if there's any questions or um, let the crew know. And uh, yeah, hope you liked it. Thank you. So, any questions? I have some presentation. Uh, I have just uh, not understood a particular detail. You were speaking about the customer mode and manufacturing mode. What is uh, used into? I mean, uh, you can even uh, perform firmware updating uh, even if, he, if you are in customer mode? Yeah, design. firmware upgrades work in customer mode by design. So all the hit commands uh, also check if you're in customer mode or manufacturing mode, but firmware upgrades work in customer mode because obviously I'm a customer and I need my firmware to be upgraded. So that one's not affected. Uh, other commands are. So there's a lot of really crazy hit commands that you can send that do really crazy things. Um, those you need to be in manufacturing mode to play around with. And uh, one of my goals is to obviously flash a different kind of firmware that disables that check and then, you know, have fun with that. But yeah, firmware upgrade works even in customer mode. Thank you. Over there. Awesome. Um, you had mentioned the backup recovery. Is that flashable at all? Uh, not from what I could see. So if I try to touch the bootloader section or if I try to touch anything outside of the region where the application normally loads, I wasn't able to flash it through HID. Obviously, if you get a manufacturing mode over a serial port, you can flash anywhere you want on the chip, but that requires physical access. Okay. Looks like we're done. You can always come and ask me questions later. Thank you very much once again. and. Uh, Enjoy the next talk.